113. I'm going to try to talk a little bit about, by God's grace, um, praise, you know, uh, praising God and why we should praise God. Uh, Psalm 113, verse 1 says, Praise, praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun and to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill that he may set them that he may set him with princes even with the princes of his people he maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children praise ye the lord let's pray dear god we come before you father and we praise you and we thank you because we can be here and most of all father we thank you so much for jesus oh lord we cannot thank you enough we cannot praise you enough because of, of jesus because he lived a perfect life and he died a perfect death in our place that we might be counted righteous before you that we might be loved deeply by you oh lord it's all because of jesus and may i not receive any glory here no lord but unto you and unto your name alone be given the glory for you are god and you are in the heavens and you have done whatsoever you have pleased oh god because you have looked with compassion upon sinful humankind you have looked with compassion on me Father, I pray and I plead to you that you would work in us this evening. Father, that we would behold your truth and sing out your praise. Father, I pray that you would work in me that your word would be spoken and not mine. And I also pray, Father, that, that those who hear my voice in this place, Lord, that you would open their hearts, that you would transform their minds. Oh, God, I can't do it but you can you are the one who is powerful to change and who is mighty to save father i pray that you would work that in us and may this just be a joy for us to get into your word and to see who you are and how how great you are thank you father in jesus name i pray amen psalm 113 it's a psalm of praise which isn't really surprising because the book of Psalms is, is a book of praising God. Uh, the Greek word is Psalms, but really the Hebrew is, is just praises. It's a, it's a bunch of songs that praise God. That's what Psalms exist for. And, and not only uh, that, but Psalm 113 to Psalm 118 are, are known as the Hallel, which was the songs, the six songs that the Jews uh, sang during their three greatest feasts, the Passover and Pentecost and the Feast of Tabernacles, Th these, six psalm, these six psalms. They were the heights of praise, and Psalm 113 is the first of those. It would have been sung by, by Jews for a long time in, in, in the Passover, which it could be very probable that, that Jesus himself sang the song with, with his disciples before he was crucified, before he was taken and judged. But you really get the idea here that it's just all about praising the Lord, praising the Lord, because it repeats it so many times. In verse 1 it says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. And then it ends the psalm in, chat, in verse 9 when it, when it just ends with, Praise ye the Lord. The word praise is, is ha halal from uh, Hebrew. And when you put ya on the end of it, it's hallelujah. And all of us know what hallelujah is. It's praise to the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. And I think that uh, maybe the, 
the hardest thing to, to read from this psalm is that it's a command. Um, it's not just a suggestion. You know? If you want to, or, or if it seems good to you, you know, praise the Lord. No, it's saying, praise ye the Lord. Imperative. It's commanding you to praise the Lord. That, that seems kind of hard for us because how, how can I, how can I uh, demand, how can I be demanded to praise? How can I work that up in me so that my mouth starts singing praise from my heart, not just lip singing? Well, I can't. <laughs> it's not in me to do that. It's not in me to praise the Lord. But then the, the other problem that I see is, how can God command me to praise him? Uh, that just seems egotistical. <laughs> it seems like God's just this, I just want everybody to praise me. I don't care about you, I just want you to praise me. But, but God's not like that. So, so how is it that, that he can command us to praise him? I was reading a book the other day, uh, while well, I was skimming through the book. It was, it was actually on, when the guy, the creationist guy came in, he had some books on the table back there. I just picked one up and was skimming through it, and I just happened on a, on, a, on a part of the book when it talks about people who grew up in church and then they, they leave church. And they did a whole survey of, of why people leave church and stuff, and then a bunch of other questions. And one of the questions was, what do you miss most about church? You know, you grew up in church, you're not going anymore. What is it that you miss most? Uh, and, and they said it was just astonishing that it was almost 100% across the board that what we miss most, it wasn't Sunday school or the games or the fun or the being with the people, but it was worship. What they missed most about being in church was worshiping God together. And that was just amazing to me, but, but that's, what it, that's what it is. I mean, where do you find the height of your joy when you come together here? Is it not when you hear the word, when you hear the truths, and you sing them back to God? I mean, God demanding me to praise him isn't so much he's an egotistical God wanting me to praise him. It's, I'm doing this for your joy. I, I am commanding you to praise me because I know it's what you will enjoy most. It's a joy. Guys, uh, praising God is a privilege. We should never take it for granted. We are commanded to praise him, not because he's a dictator, but because he's a joyful God, and he wants us to rejoice in him and praise him and experience that joy of praising him. So praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. And another thing, I guess, when I was reading this, that really hit me was, uh, I don't do this. <laughs> I don't do this. I, I, I do praise the Lord, I think, you know, when, when we come here to church and we sing, and maybe sometimes when I'm in the shower I'll sing a hymn or something. Um, but I think praise is so much more than that. We should never think of praising God as just um, coming together and singing, or singing time. Praise is life. Uh, we should live a life of praise to God. Um, with our actions, with our obedience, with, with every time that we are in front of temptation and the promises of sin are that if you do this, if you follow me, I will give you this, I'll give you joy, you'll be happy. Every time we say, no, that's a lie. God is the one who's really going to give me the joy that I'm looking for. God is the one who's going to fulfill my heart and I go there. That's praise. That's saying God is better than anything. That is praise to God. Because praise basically means to boast, to glory, to talk about how good, how great, how awesome he is. So guys, our, our life should be full of praise. But I think in most of our cases it's not. Sometimes we feel depressed or overborne with the things of this life, or you just don't feel like it. But we should praise him. We should praise him. And a good thing here is that he tells us how we can increase our praise and make it stronger and make it more constant. 
he tells us in the psalm, but I'm just going to tell you right now, and then we'll get into it. We should think of praise kind of like a tree. Our praise will go up. Our praise will grow stronger. Our praise will be bigger and greater towards God when our roots in the truth of the Word of God are deep. Our praise goes up, is high, when the, our truth, our knowledge, our faith in Christ and in His Word and what He teaches us are deep. So this is basically what I'm saying. The more you know God, the more you're going to praise Him. That's what I'm saying. The more you love His truth and who He is and His character, then you're going to praise Him. It's going to be the natural outcome of knowing God more. This is important, I think, for one, one really important reason, as I see it a lot, is that a lot of churches, and maybe even here, and some people, uh, they have this idea of praise as it's just making noise. Or, or, or trying to work up the emotions with just you know, little dances. Now, I don't think they dance here, but you know some churches they do. Or jumping up and down, or, or, or just, you know, I feel it, you know, the spirit, fire, 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 fire. And, 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 and it's so superficial. You might feel very emotional, but if your praise is not rooted, is not based on some truth of who God is, then it's just emotion. It's just fleshly feelings. It's not spiritual. The only thing that, that is spiritual praise is when I have, by the power of the Spirit of God, had my eyes opened to where I can behold a truth of who God is, and that truth in turn produces in me just a praise to God. You are great. You are awesome. So we got to see that truth. What is going to make your praise greater, guys, is when you're in the Word, when you're knowing who God is, when you're learning who He is and believing Him, then you're just going to praise Him. That's, that's the natural thing. So let's get into this and see how this is done with the psalmist. Verse 1, it says, Praise ye the Lord. It's a command. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. And here these psalms, as I said, were sung mostly at the Passover because these psalms, 113 to 118, talk mostly about God's deliverance of the people of Israel from Egypt. So they had a lot to do with the Passover, what the Passover was reminding them of. God's salvation, God's bringing them out from slavery and bondage to be His people. And so it's very adequate when it says, O oh, ye servants, not of Pharaoh, but ye servants of the Lord. You see, we are all, if we are of God, we are His servants. And servant could be in two forms here in the Old Testament. It could be a hired servant. You, bought, you, you, you hired him to do service for you and you, you give him a wage. Or he is your bought servant. You bought him and he is yours. And guys, God does not have hired servants. God has servants that he has paid for. I bought you from Egypt, and now you are mine. You are my people. Ye, o ye servants of the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Praise him for who he is. Praise his character. That's what it means by the name of the Lord. So servants of the Lord. I'm talking to you guys if you were bought with his blood. Servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him for who he is. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For how long? From this time forth and forevermore. Who should praise the Lord? His servants. Above all people, the ones that should be praising the Lord are his servants. Because they know what it is to be loved by their master and bought by him. And how long should they be praising the Lord from this time forth and forevermore? If you don't like <laughs> praising God, you're not going to like heaven. If you don't like praising Him. But if it is the joy of your heart, then you're going to love heaven. Because that's what we're going to be doing. Praising Him every day. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore because He is worthy to be praised for all eternity. And where? Where? We, we've seen that. For how long? For all of eternity. But where, where should we praise Him? At church? No. Verse 3. 
From the rising of the sun into the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. From the east to the west. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. We should praise him everywhere. When, how long should we praise him? For all eternity. Where? Everywhere. From the going down of the sun to the rising of the sun, we should be praising God. But what or who is God or what has he done that he is so worthy of being praised? It says it three times in the first verse. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Where? Everywhere. For how long? For eternity. But what? Who is he that he is so worthy? Who is he that should receive just praise from us continually in all places, no matter where we are, we should just praise him with our life, with our action, with our mouth. Who is he? And verse 4 tells us who he is. You see, this is the truth upon which our praise is based. We're not just singing words. There's actually a truth that we believe, that we hold on to, that causes praise in us. What is this truth? Verse 4 the Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. This is our God. He is the high king of heaven. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe. He is the one that is worthy of all of our praise. He is high above all nations, is what it says, and his glory above the heavens. You see, guys, it's not just a physical height. Like, you know, I'm here and about 3,000 miles upwards, there's God. It's talking about his value, his worth. That compared with every single person, all the nations, what it says, every single person who has ever existed and who exists and whoever will exist, all of what they are valued, all of their sum value doesn't even compare to the value of the being of God. But he is high above that. If he had a price tag on him, it would be infinite, priceless. We might have, you know, there's, we're worth something. We're worth a lot, concert, uh, according to Jesus. You know, what will a man give for his soul? Could he give, gaining the whole world isn't worth losing your soul. You know, our souls are worth more than worlds. But we don't even compare to what God is worth. You see, when we think about God, we should not think about, okay, well, we're here and God is here. Because it doesn't even compare. There's no category in which we can compare ourselves with God. It's one category is created things from archangels to worms. And then there's God. But, but there's nothing in his category because there's nothing like him. He is high above all nations worth more than everything so he is worthy of being praised you know, uh, I don't want to be mean when I say this but sometimes don't we, don't we find it burdensome to just praise God two times a week three times a week it, it, is his worth not bearing on us that we could if, if we really said you know, we're going to spend all night here how many would stay but is he not worthy of that? Is he not worthy that we just leave everything and just continually praise him for who he is because he is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens? Who, verse 5, is like unto the Lord our God? And the obvious answer to that is nobody. Just explained how there's created things and then there's God. There's nothing like him. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high? Who humbleth, verse 6, himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. God humbles himself to look at the planets and the stars and the sun and, and even earth. God has to get down on his knees and look at it. We can hurt our necks looking up at it all the time. But God is there, and he humbles himself to look at it. Guys, God is awesome. God is high above everything. But for me, that doesn't bring me much joy to want to praise him. I mean, 
He is worthy of it. He really is. Because he is high. There's none like him. He humbles himself to behold the heavens and the earth. But I'm thinking, what, what good is that to me? God is high up there and I'm down here. I'm in the dust. I was made from the dust. And I'm a sinner. I mean, I already don't feel worthy to worship God. And you're telling me that he's high up there? I can't even reach him? He's not, there's nothing like him? I, I have no hope. But then we see the gospel. And we see the gospel in this psalm. In the next verse. I mean, I'm thinking, is God even looking at me? Does he even care? I mean, it, it, when he humbles himself to behold the planets, does he even see me? And the Bible says he does. In verse 7, he raiseth the, up the poor out of the dust and lifted the needy out of the dunghill. That's the gospel. That is, that is what took place when Jesus came to the earth. And we think about it, Jesus was probably singing this song and he's singing it and said, God, you are high and I have left my father's throne to come to lift up the poor and the needy of the dunghill and from the dust. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill. This is what he does. But let's not think here, well, I'm not poor and I'm not needy. I'm pretty well off. It's not talking about material poorness. There's nothing virtuous. There's nothing that attracts God about somebody who's just poor materially. And there's nothing that attracts God about somebody or, or rejects God for just somebody who is rich materially. When the Bible talks about poor and needy or the rich, it's usually not referring to their material possessions. It's referring to the state of their heart. You see, there's nothing that's going to bring God down from his high throne to lift up the poor that is poor physically. Because I, I know a lot of poor people that don't want anything to do with God. And that they, they despise God because they are rich in their hearts. They are already comfort in their hearts. And they have all they need in their hearts. But I've also met rich people who are poor in their hearts. They are poor in spirit. You see, what God seeks after is a humble heart, not a humble pocket. How can we, brothers and sisters, ever be rich spiritually in our condition? Are we not those who are in the dust and who are in the dunghill? Are we not those worms that are not worthy of the high king of heaven coming from his throne and picking us up? We're not worthy of it. But if you don't see that, then God doesn't, doesn't come to pick you up. If you are prideful in your heart, if you're saying, I, I don't need God. I've pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I'm a self-made man, a self-made woman. I can do this. He doesn't have to humble himself to look at me. I'm, pr I'm pretty high up there. Then God resists the proud, but gives grace into the humble. He raiseth up the poor from the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with princes, verse 8, even with the princes of his people. This is what God does. God has no reason whatsoever. He has no obligation whatsoever for coming and getting people out of a dunghill. I mean, he is the highest of the high and he comes down and gets the lowest of the low and he picks them up. And he sets them with the princes of his people. And that is what God has done for us. But not only that, he does something miraculous. Verse 9, he says, He maketh the barren woman to keep house, and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. You see, it's not only that God has a poor person and he gives them, he makes them rich, he makes them rich in Christ and he sets them with the princes of his people, but he does something that is impossible. He makes a, a barren woman who cannot give children have children. Now, God has done this and can do this in two, two ways. One is, is like Rachel or, or like Hannah, who were barren, 
physically and gave birth to children, physical children. But then we also know that in, Psalm, in Isaiah 54, 1, he said, blessed are the barren because they will have much children. He's talking about spiritual children. God can give us, can make barren fool, a barren woman to keep house and be joyful mother of children. And the psalm ends with praise ye the Lord. Is this not reason enough to praise him, what he has done? Like I said, he had no reason to even look on us, but he did. And he did it in the cross. You see, when we think about uh, this saving action of God, it wasn't just what he did for Israel and Egypt, but it's what he does. It's who he is. You see, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And Christ came and gave us life while we were dead. There was nothing in us that moved God off of his throne to come to us. It's because it's who he is. He came and he saved us. He, Jesus, was the perfect servant of the Lord. Who did always that which pleases the Father. And who left his throne and humbled himself to behold the things that are heaven and earth. And he humbled himself to be our servant. And he humbled himself even unto death, even the death of the cross. That we might be made kings and priests with our Lord. I want to read um, Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16, not the whole chapter. Because it's a, it's a great picture of what God has done for us. Who we were and what God has done for us in, in the gospel. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nat nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother a Hittite. And as for thy nativity, and the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thou washed in water to supple thee, Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person and the day that thou wast born. Here Ezekiel is describing a picture of Israel. When he was, when he was born, he was just cast out. He was, his umbilical cord wasn't even cut. He wasn't even washed. He was just thrown out into the field, left for dead. In verse 6 says, And when I passed by thee, and saw thee, polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. And we lived. Because God gives us life when we are dead in our trespasses and sins. This is what God does for us. You see, if you ever doubt God's love for you, just remember, he didn't have to send Jesus, and, but Jesus came. And he didn't have to wake up your heart and open your mind to the truth of the gospel, but if you're here and you believe in him, he did it. Not because of you, not because there was any desirable thing in you, but because he is the God who, though he is seated high on his throne, he humbles himself and he lifts up the needy and the poor out of the dunghill. And brothers and sisters, to close, just who are we to think that we are too good uh, to help our brothers and sisters? Or, or to stoop and pick up someone who's needing, who is in the dust, when God, who is higher than all things, did it? Sometimes I think we're too good to get our hands dirty. But God did it for us. God did it for us. Uh, Jonathan Edwards said, 
a man or a Christian who thinks he's better than his brother uh, is just like a worm that is boasting itself because he's higher up on the dunghill than the other worm. And, and that's, what, that's what it is. When we understand, we embrace the truth of the gospel, we have no way to be prideful. But the only thing that should come out of our souls, of our mouths, is just praise to our God. Praise to Him. Because even though He is the High King, He came and He saved us. And He lifted us out of the dirt. Let's pray. God, thank You so much for this day. Thank you, Father, for the time that we can spend worshiping you in your house. Oh, Lord, we need you so much. We need you because we are those who are low and poor and needy. Father, we, we need you to come to us and to save us. Oh, Father, if I can be here, it's because you have done that. Not because there's anything in me or in any of us but because, Lord, you took pity on us and were merciful. Praise be to your name, because you are worthy. I pray that you would strengthen our praise towards you. I pray that you would deepen our, our understanding and our faith about who you are, and that our lives would just be continually praising you in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>